everybody. Great to see you all here today. As we wrap up the month of March 2021, what a crazy year it's been, um, reflecting back on where we were a year ago today. Um, we started these, these weekly calls. Um, and I wanna just give a big shout out to our board of directors. Our next board meeting will take place on Tuesday, April 13th at 7.30 in the morning. I'll be sending out the board packet soon. Um, and I wanna give a special shout out to our tireless board president from the past two years, Pat Arnold, who um, is my boss for two more days. Um, thank you so much, Pat, for everything you've done. And um, I'm looking forward to working with our new incoming president, Laura Mullen. And uh, Pat just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk to the group and give us any final words of wisdom. Thank you, Bettina. I'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, this has been a uh, long, very interesting uh, two years, and I think we've gotten a lot done. I think we came together as a group um, far better than I hoped, and our relationship with the city as both give and take and collaborative is the best I've ever seen. So that makes me really happy. Um, for those of you who don't know, we have a weekly call with them as we work through everything from issues we've never even heard of and words we haven't heard of to uh, zigzag lights down the streets that we wanted to do forever. So um, again, thank you everybody. Thank you for those on the call and for those that are um, tireless downtown slow promoters that continue to get the word out. I know we have a a small married group on our Monday calls and the, the same translates to um, both the committees which we're working on and the board itself and I, I appreciate all your um, your output as you uh, as you spread the word so thanks again everybody Bettina thank you it's been a true pleasure and uh, I for those of you who don't know I'm staying on for a year as past president and I will be here to work on the vacancy vibrancy task force and whatever uh, Laura tasks me with so thank you all Wonderful. Thanks again, Pat. And I, one thing I really want to just call out is your consistency. And even today, you're wearing the same shirt today that you're wearing in your headshot. So I don't know how you managed to pull that off. <laughs> I, have, I have a limited wardrobe and I love my shirts. So I just stick with them. And I have to be honest, I have a couple of the same color. I'm not going to lie to this group. Love it. Well, that's, that's the efficiency shining yeah. through. The engineer in me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Love it. All right. Well, I'll, I'll talk to you later today. Thanks very much, Pat. Um, with that, Rachel, you want to talk a little bit about where we are in terms of our COVID reality? Yes. So uh, as of Friday, March 26th, uh, we still remain in the substantial or red tier. And Slow County has 20,402 positive cases of COVID-19 in Slow County this is, you know, since the beginning with currently 260 active cases. So still good to see that number low, um, but we have seen some increases that are kind of keeping us in that red tier. Um, we are at 255 lives lost in Soak County due to COVID-19. Um, another reminder of the toll that this has taken with 124,728 doses administered in Slow County. So this number has changed since the last few weeks that we've been sharing. This number is doses administered in the county, so not technically people vaccinated. Um, that number isn't available for the entire Slow County, which includes Slow County Public Health, as well as the pharmacies and other pieces. So this is people, in Slow County who have had a dose administered. Um, a constant reminder that, you know, our testing has started to drop. So a reminder for people that testing is available and to visit readyslow.org. Um, you know, it's really going to be helping our numbers so we can hopefully continue to inch toward moving into that uh, tier three orange tier. Uh, vaccine eligibility. More vaccine pieces have been coming online and we heard really good news from the state. Um, looking forward toward April 15th where it's hopefully going to be opening up. Um, but vaccine eligibility is available on readyslowrecoverslow.org. With that, Bettina, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you very much, Rachel. Yeah, it is definitely good news to see the shots getting into people's arms. And um, as Rachel mentioned, the state announced that April 1st, it will be all Californians ages 50 and up. Although in our county, you can get a shot now if you are 50 and up. 
um, and then starting April 15th, anybody who's age 16 and up um, will be eligible for the vaccine. So this is wonderful news. Um, I know I'm looking forward to getting mine. Um, and other uh, federal and state relief programs do continue. And we do wanna hear from you about what kind of relief you've gotten from for your business. Um, we did this poll last week and we'd like to hear from you a little bit um, if you weren't on the call last week. Um, so Rachel, if you could launch poll one right now. Um, we do have the Paycheck Protection Program, which is still open, and the um, forgiveness uh, paperwork can still be filed right now. And we're still seeing what the ARP, or American Rescue Plan, is going to do in terms of our state and local government funding. Um, that'll help bridge some of the shortfalls that were predicted in this fiscal year. Um, we're also seeing those so uh, direct payments, the stimulus payments or relief payments um, coming in and people are spending them. Um, so plan your marketing accordingly. We definitely are seeing elements of people spending downtown. Um, there's a, a phenomenon that you can witness of people wanting to spend their money. Um, even my very miserly fixed income father um, splurged on a gourmet pie. So this is proof that um, you can really, you can use this to your advantage if you're trying to reach customers. Um, and they have some extra money coming in. So we'll go ahead and share the results from this poll now so you can take a look at that. And um, speaking of people spending their money, we got a report last week from SlowCal, Visit SlowCal, our county tourism marketing district, about um, how tourism has been affected in San Luis Obispo County for the last the, the, the quarter that we're in right now. And um, it's interesting to me, I, over the weekend, I saw a lot of visitors downtown, a lot of people who were kind of looking around, trying to figure out where they were, figuring out wayfinding, asking for recommendations. Um, people are definitely on spring break. And we have seen that here. So there's some really interesting data here that I think bodes well for our community. We have seen um, that San Luis Obispo remains the second most popular destination um, in terms of people who've been uh, visiting here. Um, you can see the top 10 origin markets. Um, it continues to be the visitors from the Valley and Los Angeles. Visitors from the Bay Area have declined a little bit. You can see this in the origin market top 10 right here. Um, air travel continues to um, be robust despite what we have seen in terms of um, people's uh, reluctance to fly, um, and flights have continued to develop um, into our city as a destination. So we are seeing that Phoenix um, hub as a great connector, um, and then the Seattle flight, which was new, I think that was implemented maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, continues to be a great driver for us as well. You can see a five-year trend. Um, from February up to from 2016 to 2021. Um, we're actually not down that much um, for a tourism based organization uh, destination, a city such as San Luis Obispo, we're um, doing okay. Um, not down, you know, dramatically, not in the 50%, 60% down, but more down by like 30%. So it'll be really interesting. And I wanted to share these with you so that you could think about downtown San Luis Obispo really as being a hub for tourism in the county. Uh, we were talking amongst our team last week about the fact that we still have not seen a summer tourism season in downtown Slow with the two new hotels fully operational. So we did have a little bit of occupancy um, over the summer and we saw the impact of that. But as people start to get vaccinated and we see the Hotel Slow and Hotel Cerro and the Granada and the Garden Street Inn, start to fill up with guests, um, we're gonna see a lot more visitors in the downtown. So with that in mind, um, we want to be mindful of the fact that your schedules are gonna get a lot busier going forward. And so we wanna ask um, how you enjoy these meetings, if you still find them helpful. Um, we're also gearing up internally for re-launching re, re, uh, some of our programs, which is very exciting, um, but we, that means that our team is gonna have a little less time to coordinate these weekly meetings as well. So we're gonna ask you how you would like to have these meetings and we'll continue to have these weekly meetings through the month of April and then we will um, evaluate this over the next month and we will go into, um, uh, we'll tell you what we're gonna to plan to do going forward in May. 
And speaking of May, I do have an exciting announcement for you all. And I'm going to invite our farmer's market manager um, slash marketing expert slash does everything that she was asked to over the course of the last year, uh, Whitney Cheney, to come on and talk a little bit about what's going on at the farmer's market. Thank you, Bettina. Yes, I am happy to announce that the farmer's market will be returning on May 6th. Thursday, May 6th is our return. So we're about a month out. Uh, when the market does return, it will be a smaller condensed market of just our fresh produce and veggies. Our certified farmers will be there as well as a few prepackaged vendors that have things like bread and pastries, um, just essential goods to get leave, go eat dinner somewhere else. It will not be the hot food vendors. It will not be the entertainers during this first initial stage, uh, but we're really excited to have our essentials market is basically what we're going to call it uh, on May 6th. It will be returning. So it'll be about two blocks on Higuera Street. More to come on that. Uh, we're working on some marketing information that will be filtering through our social media channels, and we're just really excited to get back to it. Great. Well, and thank you, Whitney. I know this has been an incredible <laughs> journey and we've all learned a lot but um, I especially want to just call out the fact that you're being so attentive to trying to make sure we have the pieces in place to support people's access to fresh and healthy food. Um, can you just talk briefly about what that's looked like for for us and what that will look like for shoppers at the market? Yeah we're in the process right now so our before we went on pause we had an offering of EBT electronic Bennett transfer or SNAP, some people might know it as that. So we're in the process of making sure that that program is up and running as well, uh, submitting the documentation for that. Um, hopefully it will be good to go by May 6th, if not shortly thereafter. Uh, we have been offering our CSA produce boxes in the office right now as a way for people to get fresh produce, um, but we're really, we're making sure we're, we have access for everyone, uh, marginalized communities, the downtown residents I know who have been missing the access to that fresh produce. So. We're making sure everything is lined up and ready to go. And yeah, May 6th, it's happening. Great. Well, thank you so much. So save the date. And um, we're going to be doing some strategic announcing about this. Um, we want people to come back and shop for their veggies and support the downtown restaurants. But we obviously don't want 10,000 people descending on downtown. So um, thanks so much. And we hope to see you all there with your produce bags ready to shop and support our farmers so that we can come back even stronger when it's time to do so. Um, just another save the date, we are going to be hosting a meeting on um, downtown safety and homelessness. We have some great speakers lined up. We know that this is a question um, that is an, an issue that we've seen really come to the forefront um, of what's happening downtown. So we have some speakers from the County of San Luis Obispo who will be talking about the update to their homeless services plan. We'll have Derek Johnson, the city manager from San Luis Obispo. He'll talk about the major city goals and the collaborative partnerships that the city is working on. We'll have your downtown sergeant from Slow PD, uh, Sergeant Dickel. We'll talk about how you can protect your business. Um, we'll have John Clevens, who is our social worker embedded with the community action team with Slow PD. Um, he'll be talking about working towards solutions to help people um, leave the the, who find housing and find permanent housing. Um, and we'll have our Capslow outreach worker, Junior Menchaca, talk about connecting people with services and what kinds of services exist at 40 Prado at our city's um, homeless shelter. So save the date for this. We'll be sending out a Zoom announcement um, and a link in our member email that will go out uh, tomorrow and next week. We're looking forward to having that conversation. Um, our county supervisor for this district is um, unfortunately not able to join us this week, but she did ask me to give a little bit of an update. So as we mentioned earlier, all county residents 50 and over can register to get the vaccine at Ready Slow. Um, there was an expansion of anybody who is in the judicial system, which includes anybody who has been um, summoned for jury duty, uh, benefit of jury duty that we did not have before. Um, and then anybody who is in the current eligible categories, including food and agriculture, which means restaurant workers, um, and those of any age with underlying conditions. So um, as we said earlier, go to readyslow.org or <clears throat> excuse me, vaccinefinder.org. Local pharmacies also have product um, to, to get out there. Um, and then she also uh, wanted to remind everybody that things are getting better. 
Um, and much as we are evaluating our kind of emergency response, um, the county is going to be doing the Wednesday afternoon media briefings every other Wednesday going forward. So those have been sort of a touchstone for us through the course of the last year, and they're going to be moving that to every other week. Um, and our county health officer, Dr. Borenstein, continues to say that, listen, if we don't continue to wear the mask and stay home and limiting gatherings, that we're probably going to stay in the red tier for some time. So um, we'll probably hear a little bit more from, from Lee at the city in a few minutes about what that might look like. But we have to remember to stay vigilant, even if you are vaccinated, keep wearing that mask and um, being a good citizen. So um, up next, I'm going to ask Courtney from Cal Poly. Um, how are you today, Courtney? I'm great. Thanks, Katina. How are you? I'm doing well. Good morning, all. Um, I appreciate these calls so much. And Whitney, too, just wanted to mention um, how amazing it is, all the work that you've done. And I feel like that's breaking news that May 6th is the opening date for Farmer's Market. I haven't seen that in the Tribune or anything, so maybe I missed it, but. Nope, it um, is breaking news. Yeah, so that feels really special that the, the people on this call get to be um, the first to hear about that date and how exciting that is for um, really so far beyond um, the businesses and uh, people of Downtown Slow, but the impact um, that is so far and wide that is that uh, market. So thank you for, for all of that. Um, and in terms of Cal Poly, um, today is day one of spring quarter. Uh, spring break was last week and we have about 300 students that are moving in for the first time this quarter. They deferred um, the last two quarters and will be joining our residence hall populations uh, starting, well, starting on Thursday. So you may have seen um, some of those families as they, they moved the students in. Um, we are requiring all students, we did require all students to test uh, just like we did in fall and winter quarters within 72 hours of returning to campus, immediately when they arrive here, and then every three days, just like we have for, for the other quarters. Um, we have a total of 1,627 cases, and that um, encompasses all of the cases we've had since the start of COVID and testing on campus. Um, we're doing all saliva testing now for students, staff, and faculty. Um, and we're excited about the news that the state announced by April 15th that all, all 16 and older will be able to access vaccines, um, which includes our student population. Um, wanted to make two more quick updates. Um, there was a Mustang News article about housing, and I know that won't be surprising to you um, to read it, but just the crunch that students are, are always going through to try to, to find affordable housing here. Um, and then we, the uh, state also announced on Friday that commencements and graduation ceremonies can now have um, families and uh, households participate. So um, it's limited, it's spaced, um, but does uh, open up our ability to have a little bit of a broader um, population come here for those ceremonies um, in just a few months. So, so we're going to be figuring that out. Um, and but wanted I know that has a lot of impact for our downtown businesses. So wanted to make sure you all are aware of that change. Great. Wow, that's really interesting, Courtney. I hadn't heard about that. Um, with with the April fifteenth date of the sixteen and over, and that including students, um, is there a plan in place for vaccination, education, deployment? Can you answer that question? Oh, yes, I can answer that question. We've been working intensely on that for months. Um, so yes, there's a, there's a plan um, touching, you know, everything you can think of uh, between social media, direct communications through email, we're gonna have signage all over campus. Um, we are, uh, we don't have a date, uh, but we are working to set up a point of distribution for vaccine on campus. Um, and there's, so there's a ton of planning that's been going into that. And um, as you mentioned earlier, the, the state's guidance to open up to 50 and older on April 1st in our county tracking a little bit ahead of that so far. Um, so we'll see if it's even, um, if, if students even have to wait until the 15th date to receive that vaccine, uh, depending on how our, our county tracks with that. But, um, but yeah, so, so much going into the, the communications um, and just all the information to empower students to feel really good about their choice um, to make that to get the vaccine. 
And this is a, just a curiosity for me, but is the alternative care site going to be converted into a vaccination site or has that already been taken down? It has not been taken down. Um, we did sign, um, despite how well the, that uh, our county is doing, um, we have not taken it down and did sign the contract to leave it in place for a few more months. Um, that will not be, that is not the planned site for uh, distribution of vaccine. It's, it would be, um, well, we're still working out those details, but likely at campus health and well-being or at the PAC, like the testing is being done. Great. Okay. Got it. Thank you. I haven't been on campus in such a long time. I, I literally didn't even know if the tent was still up out there. So thank you. All right. Um, and I'm, and I'm also assuming that we don't have any news about percentages of in campus on campus classes and those sorts of things for fall yet. Or summer well for fall um for summer it's still going to be the plan right now is for it to be mostly virtual um like it has been about 11 to 12 percent maybe a little bit more than we've had um this quarter in the past two quarters but in the fall the chancellor announced um and our president is planning on having it uh, be as much back to normal as we can there will still be public health um guidelines that we'll be adhering to, but the hope is that it will be somewhat close to a normal quarter with mostly in-person classes um, and services on campus. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you, Courtney. Um, really appreciate your, your stewardship, and I know I have a meeting with you later this week, so um, I'll look forward to that. Um, thank you so much. And I know we as a downtown business community are really going to look forward to having a more robust student population back in the community. Um, I have noticed an uptick as well in um, people who are hiring. There's just there are more jobs as people as more customers are returning. So um, that'll be really helpful to have more students to pull from. And hopefully downtown slow will also be able to begin our internship program again, which was suspended last year. Um, we've really relied on, on interns to help our program succeed. So thank you for that. Um, up next, we're going to hear from Lee Johnson at the city of SLO. How are you this morning, Lee? Good, Virginia. Can you see and hear me okay? Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, as uh, a few people mentioned, um, our numbers are still in the red. Um, our trend has not been really our friend. Uh, the numbers have gone a little bit in the wrong way. It's primarily driven by the adjusted case rate and the gap between the adjusted case rate and the total cases is narrowing. And what that means is that we're not doing, we're doing less testing than we used to do. And so that's why our case rate is, adjusted case rate is going a little bit the wrong way. Um, as an example, uh, this past week, or the past week in reporting, we did about 406 tests per 100,000 people and with an adjusted case rate of seven. And then if you go back to like our best case rates when we were uh, in the lower numbers, we were doing testing in the 800, 900,000 per 100,000 people. So testing really helps us to get there. The number that is outside is the adjusted uh, case rate, which right now would need to get to 3.9 to move us to orange. Um, but we are currently at 3.4 million doses of vaccine given in the lowest quartile of the healthy index. Um, and if we hit 4 million, that raises that case rate number from 3.9 to 5.9. So we have a lot less distance to cover to get there. So we could hit that 4 million this week, potentially, uh, in this state, or maybe early next week. So if we have good numbers tomorrow, and, good, and it's also retroactive, and good numbers next Tuesday, that's the soonest we could go to orange. But uh, it really depends on the numbers and people wearing masks, staying distanced, washing your hands, getting tested, and getting vaccinated. Um, other than that, uh, just a quick update on the buy local bonus. Um, there's 142, as of last week, 142 businesses enrolled. Uh, we've had 2,946 qualified shoppers use the program. Um, that was 58, almost $60,000 in gift cards awarded. Uh, 
10,000 in submitted expenses, so 510,000 in total spending. And that makes an average of $173 per submittal per participant. So going well, um, it'll be wrapping up here shortly and then we'll see what we do uh, moving forward. That's all that I have today. Great, well, thank you, Lee. <clears throat> um, just in case anybody on the call is a uh, restaurant operator who has a parklet downtown, um, we also saw an email come through last week from, um, from the Open Slow program about just making sure that there are, the, the guidelines are being followed in terms of tents and heaters and roofs and all of that stuff too. So if you have any questions about that, um, we can send that out or you can probably reach out to Lee or to Matt Crisp with the city. Um, so that is on that. Thank you very much, Lee. And um, up next, we have Mr. Jim D'Antona from the Slow Chamber. How are you this morning, Jim? Right Doing there. great, Bettina. Good to see you. Hello. Damn it. I always get caught by that mute button. So. Uh, well, good seeing everybody. And uh, Lee took uh, most things I was going to say. Uh, thank you. Uh, so well, all I would do is add up in that buy local bonus. We're in the buy local bonus bonus program, which you've heard, which is that doubling of gift cards when you turn in receipts. So again, where you can, if you want to promote that from inside your business, uh, of folks, of ways to come spend money at your business and then come get double the gift cards, one of your choice, one of our choice to give you that. Uh, so we're in the bonus of the bonus bonus program. Um, I would just add that on and tell folks to spread the word so we can get those out and keep the spending going. Um, additionally, I wanted to uh, just let you know that um, obviously that we were you know, really obviously want to get to that orange tier. And so key is what Penny said, what Lee said, what all those trying to make sure that we do our best to uh, continue to slow the spread uh, out there. Um, finally, what I would say is the chamber we're about to launch, we have two programs, obviously Insight Studio, some of obviously have heard of, worked with before. We have um, a new set of um, meetings coming out, events, that will work to kind of improve your middle managers, people of you know helping them become better managers and help build your staff stronger, uh, which will be coming being announced in the next few weeks. And then a brand new program, um, and thanks to our a couple of the folks on this call, Cal Poly and Pacific Western Bank for being sponsors of this, is a, a new uh, program we're running called Cracking the Government Code. Um, and it's really just for folks to become better citizens of uh, our community and understanding regionally who does what in government, why, what does all the jargon mean? Um, so we're gonna start building that program so that our residents, our business people, everybody start to understand a little bit more about how government operates and how do we engage government. Um, some of the things feel like there's big walls up um, and we're gonna look to show you how to break those down. Um, so that'll be a, a whole program that will span uh, five events over the next kind of six months um, and should be a really interesting, great program that we're putting together. And we'll launch and let everybody know, but that'll be launching in the next week or two. So just wanna kind of give you those things a heads up um, and looking forward obviously to getting that. Love hearing about the uh, market Coming back in some form, seeing that engine getting revved up. Congratulations, you guys. That's so awesome. Thanks, Jim. Um, I have a question about the the code, the decoder. Is is it going to come with a decoder ring where it has like the, the municipal code written on the inside, like the Lord of the Rings kind of situation? It is. And it's a uh, 100 by 100 feet. And you have to spin <laughs> it in some giant way. And it's almost no. It, it's it's going to be a lot of fun. And it's actually, we really, as we were, as I was talking, it, it was too late for Carl Dudley as he posted in chat, but he was hopeful that his, through his support, we could get others to understand what it was and how we can really engage on what zoning is, on where budgets come from. I mean, we heard a lot in our last election of folks who wanted to run for city council, right? And wanted to talk about, oh, I wanna redo the whole budget. Well, is that even possible? Is that even a reality? Answer, you know, 
uh, spoiler alert, no, you can't do that, but you can do things to tweak and what does that look like? And so hopefully engaging our community and making them, everybody understand where we can really plug in to be effective uh, for our community and our region. So, but yeah, I would love a decoder ring, man, if it was that easy. <laughs> That's great. Well, I look forward to that. Um, it's, it's so interesting and the, the civic idea of really participating and understanding how to critique, you know, when you know what you're talking about, you're, you're always going to be more effective. So cool. I'll look forward to that. Thank you awesome. very much. All right. Um, what we're going to do now is, um, I neglected to mention this earlier, but we are all looking forward to April 1st, not because it's April Fool's Day. Um, <clears throat> no cruel jokes this year, I think, really. We're, we don't have the capacity for that. Um, but April 1st is the day that the governor has um, said that they will release some criteria for in-person arts and entertainment um, activities to take place. So this is something that the arts community has really been looking forward to um, for a year now. And so we invited Chris Miller from the PAC to talk a little bit about the uh, perception survey that the Central Coast Coalition of Arts Leaders has developed. Good morning, Chris, how are you? Good morning, Bettina. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for inviting us and uh, happy to give you all an update. Um, so a little less than a year ago, as we went into the pandemic, um, uh, the arts community here locally came together and formed a uh, loose coalition of about 25 to 30 uh, arts organizations and venues around the county to uh, work together to uh, address the challenges that the pandemic um, has caused our industry. Um, and uh, uh, among several of the programs that we've done has been a, a series of audience perception surveys over the last year to assess um, how our audiences feel about when to come back to performances uh, safely, what that will look like, et cetera, et cetera. So we just did the third iteration of that survey um, if this uh, past month. Um, closed the survey on March 15th and collated the results. We sent the survey out to about 30,000 uh, arts uh, attendees throughout the county from our various um, lists of our various organizations and got a, um, what we feel is a good response, about 4,200 responses, um, 900 more than uh, when we did the last iteration of the survey way back in July. Um, which I think indicates that people are, are um, even more anxious now to get back to attending performances and um, uh, are feeling that that is um, uh, in the future. Um, so uh, of the, the 4,200 or so respondees, um, a, a little over 60% of them came from what is pretty much our core demographic of arts audiences here locally, um, those who are 55 and above. A nice broad geographical distribution across the county. Um, about 25% of the respondees were from Slow County, uh, uh, the city of Slow itself, and, um, and then sort of more weighted to South County, um, but good representation from North County as well. So that was encouraging. Um, and uh, of those attendees, um, uh, about 50, a little more than 50% of them are avid arts attendees attending three or more performances um, a year. And uh, so we asked about um, you know, some general demographic questions, their experience with um, uh, live stream performances, uh, their interest in outdoor performances, and in general, what conditions they will be looking um, for us to present as we return to indoor performances. Um, surprisingly, I guess to some of us, um, we're definitely seeing um, uh, tepid uh, enthusiasm for live stream performances. Of the respondees to the survey, um, uh, more than 60% had not watched a single online performance in the last three months. Um, and those who had, um, uh, there was moderate enthusiasm for that format, but uh, so, so that um, helps us think about how to how much energy to put into those types of events as we as we move forward uh, back towards uh, live performances. Um, and 
in terms of outdoor performances, uh, we asked just about a series of formats for outdoor performances. And um, the drive-in format where you stay in your car and watch either a recorded performance or a, a live performance, but staying in your car was not particularly um, popular. But uh, conversely, going to an outdoor performance where you actually get to sit outside and watch the live performance um, was very appealing to folks as the transition back to indoor performances. So um, as Bettina said, we are um, uh, looking forward to being able to do that under the, um, the new state guidelines. We've just got some clarification about that last week because um, our concern here locally was that we don't have many outdoor venues with um, fixed seating, which the initial guidelines for outdoor performances required. So uh, got some more flexibility in that. And as um, Bettina said, we're anxiously awaiting information about uh, indoor performances. Um, and a uh, variety of um, folks responded that they had already received the vaccine um, or were very likely to get it. Um, uh, overall, only le less than 10% of the respondees said they were unlikely to get the vaccine. So that was encouraging. Um, and um, th there's quite a lot of detail in, in how we asked um, what conditions uh, folks want to see as we return to live performances, uh, continuing to wear masks, uh, some form of social distancing, et cetera. And um, in the interest of time, I won't go into great detail there, but it provides some some good information for our organizations to, to guide our planning to return to, to indoor performances. Um, folks are still somewhat nervous about attending performances at 100% capacity, um, seem to be um, still wanting to see some capacity limitations. So we'll see how that evolves over the next series of, of iterations of the survey, which we plan to do every eight weeks or so as we get close to returning to indoor performances. Um, I'm happy to share the results of the survey um, with anyone who'd like. Um, and uh, so Bettina, I can send the link to you and, and you guys can forward that on if, if you think that that will yes, be interesting. Sure. Okay. Yeah, or if it's if it's hosted somewhere, you could certainly drop a link into the chat as well. Um, okay, great, I, I will do that, yeah. Thank you, Chris, this is really yeah. interesting and I know um, I've been reading over the weekend, there's conversation happening in New York about a vaccine passport to get into you know, large venues like Madison Square Garden, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm maybe expecting that some of this guidance that we'll get from the governor on April 1st may include something about that. I, I can't recall, however, was there a vaccine passport or proof of vaccination question in your survey? There was not. We debated whether to ask that or not. Um, certainly we've had discussions internally at, at the coalition about whether that will be a requirement and what the legal aspects are of that. Um, can we even require people to prove uh, that they've been vaccinated and how would, we, how would we manage that? Um, so I think that will um, definitely be a subject for ongoing discussion and we'll be watching how that rolls out uh, and other communities around the country as we get closer to indoor performances. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and I'll keep drop, up uh, there's a, a wonderful press release um, on the results that Patty Thayer um, put together for us. So I'll drop a link to that in the chat and also the survey results as well. Great. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, Appreciate it. Okay, so I wanted to let everybody know um, that we are always trying to share with you resources we get from our partners at the International Downtown Association and Main Street America. And Main Street America is having their Main Street Now conference online, surprise, this year, April 12th to the 14th. There is a special small business day um, and you can sign up for that on Tuesday, April 13th. The price for that is just $25, I believe. Um, we'll send out some information about that. If you want to sign up, you would be able to connect with small business owners all over the country, um, many of whom are uh, set up in small towns like San Luis Obispo. Um, so we'll share those in, that information with you about how to sign up. We hope that that will be helpful to you. 
And uh, the Mayflower Initiative, oh, we did not update this slide, so I'm gonna skip through it. Um, we are very pleased to announce, speaking of the Main Street America program, that we got one of 10 grants in a competitive national grant program for the Main Street Resiliency Grant Program. And the funds that we're receiving, um, $8,500, will go toward our Mayflower Initiative, which we've been working hard on. So we're really, really excited about this. Um, not only did we receive this grant from the National Main Street Program, but we also received uh, $10,000 from the City of SLO Promotional Coordinating Committee to activate a Mayflower pop-up in Mission Plaza. So we have more than 70 businesses signed up already for the Mayflower Initiative. We have more than 60 artists signed up to participate. Um, and in Mission Plaza, we're going to put in colorful lights. We'll have a chalk art component. Um, we'll have a butterfly garden built by the Cal Poly Rose Float team. Really excited about getting those students back to work. Um, and we'll have a scavenger hunt with the San Luis Obispo Children's Museum. So look for more information about that coming up. And we'll be spending the next five weeks generating more fun and creative ways to make sure that downtown slow blooms in May. Um, also, this month, we are going to have another cleanup day for downtown slow. And this is going to be on Saturday, April 17th. Our AmeriCorps member, Cassidy Shevlin, is organizing this day, and she and our ambassadors will be overseeing this program. Um, all you need to do is just come and sign up. We um, sign up and then come down. We'll provide you with an apron, all the, the tools that you need, um, and you can just spend a couple of hours helping our downtown shine um, and then get it ready for those Mayflowers to bloom in May. Um, we do still have gloves. Every week I tell you about these wonderful gloves that were donated by Trust Automation. So if you would like to get some for your reopening um, or for your staff, just let us know. Our, our stack that you can see here um, is dwindling, but we do still have probably about 30 boxes left. So we want to get them onto hands protecting your employees. Let us know how we can do that. And of course, our downtown dine out program with the parks and recreation program of the city of slow is open every day 11am to 8pm today will be a beautiful day to go and take some takeout down down there and enjoy um, the beautiful mission plaza. So with that, um, we can take any questions that you might have. There's a lot of great information. I thank all the speakers today for being with us. Um, hope you can join us for our downtown cleanup day, our safety meeting. Uh, members of the Parking and Access Committee meeting will also be having a special ad hoc meeting, um, and that will come out soon. And um, another big thank you to our outgoing board president, Pat Arnold, and an incoming welcome to our board president, official April 1st, Laura Mullen. Thanks, everybody, so much. We will see you again here next week. <laughs>